Monsieur le Chancelier, j'ai l'honneur de vous présenter Madame Nathalie Panek, ingénieure aérospatiale déterminée à viser très haut à aider les autres à faire de même. Ms. Panek currently develops space robotics, including instruments for the International Space Station at Maxair Technologies, MDA, in Toronto. But her larger goal is to become an astronaut herself. As she has said, it's funny, people always say they meet lots of eight-year-olds who want to be astronauts, but not 30-year-olds. Just so, Ms. Panek believes that interest in the STEM fields is inculcated in childhood. She benefited from some inspiring role models, including a particularly cool female physics teacher. Now she's acting on what she considers one of the greatest responsibilities any of us has, to empower the next generation. Through speaking engagements, volunteerism, online outreach and mentoring programs, Ms. Panek is a voice of encouragement to young women who aspire to studies and careers in STEM, much like Concordia alumna Gina Cody. Ms. Panek defines personal success as a combination of happiness from her own pursuits and feeling like she is making a difference, helping others. Monsieur le Chancelier, au nom du Sénat et du Conseil d'administration de l'Université, j'ai le privilège et l'honneur de vous présenter Madame Nathalie Panek afin que vous lui donniez d'enseigner un doctorat et science honoris causa. Congratulations, Dr. Penny. Would you please address the convocation? Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Mr. Chancellor, Mr. President and Vice Chancellor, honored platform guests, graduating class, and family and friends. Congratulations to all the graduates today. I'm so excited for what your future holds. And I think to think about the future, we often have to reflect on the past. So I thought I'd spend a few minutes and share with you a bit about my journey and where it all began for me. So I grew up in Calgary in Alberta's Rockies. And every Friday afternoon, my parents would load my two brothers and myself and a whole bunch of gear into their old Chrysler Cordoba. And we'd start a nearly two and a half hour journey southwest of Calgary to a small municipality called the Crow's Nest Pass, where my grandparents lived. As soon as we got there, my brothers and I would jump out of the car, run and give our grandparents big hugs, and then go play in the backyard or in their garden until my parents loaded all the gear from the car into our trailer. About an hour later, we'd say goodbye to our grandparents and start another nearly hour-long journey to the middle of nowhere in the backcountry in an area called Kananaskis, where we would be camping for the next couple of days. And over Saturday and Sunday, we spent hours and hours outside, fishing, hiking, and riding bikes. And it felt like we had complete freedom and the ability to explore and go wherever we wanted to. But what I loved most about those weekends was after we ate dinner, we lit a big campfire and stayed there just long enough to get warm before I could go run out into the big field and gaze up at the stars, to look up at the constellations and try to identify them, to maybe see the International Space Station going by, or even catch a glimpse of a shooting star. And it was on those many weekends, year after year, that I decided I didn't just want to be exploring here on Earth, I wanted to be exploring up there. I wanted to be traveling to space, or even maybe be the captain of my own starship, like the USS Enterprise. I realized as I got older that I probably wasn't gonna get to run a starship, but maybe I could become an astronaut. And so began a 20 plus year journey of trying to figure out how to make that happen. 
The thing about wanting to become an astronaut is that there isn't a guidebook. There aren't step-by-step -step instructions telling you exactly how to do that. There are so many different paths you can pursue in trying to become an astronaut, whether it's engineering or becoming a scientist or studying medicine or even becoming a pilot. So I try to gather as many experiences and opportunities and activities as I could that I thought might be helpful on a resume one day if I ever had the chance to apply to become a Canadian astronaut. So I did things like join a solar powered car team in university and then got to race that car across North America from Austin, Texas, north to Winnipeg and then west back to Calgary. I also learned how to fly a plane in university because I thought that would look really good on a resume and to now working for the last 10 years at a company working on space robotics. So that's anything from next generation Canada arms to a Mars rover that's actually going to launch in 2020, which is super, super cool. And all of these experiences that I've had have required three things, courage, conviction, and confidence. Courage to even set such a wild goal in the first place that so few Canadians have accomplished conviction to stick with it year after year for 20 plus years, and confidence to even believe that this is something that I could achieve in the first place, that I have the skills to contribute and to work in the aerospace industry. It's been a fine balance between managing vulnerability and risk taking to try and find my place along this path of wanting to journey to space. And one of my absolute favorite activities that I had the opportunity to participate in was a space studies program through the International Space University down at NASA's Ames Research Center. This was a really intensive two-month program where we took all kinds of courses in everything from orbital mechanics to spacecraft design to space law and policy and space and physical life sciences. We got to go on tours to really awesome space companies in the area and listen to many lectures and panels and plenary sessions with aerospace professionals. And it was during this program that I met one of my best friends, who is now a propulsion engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And we immediately bonded over a similar love of wanting to go to space, a similar passion for space, and coming from countries where the space programs were relatively small or non-existent at the time, as she's from Australia. And it was just great to have someone who had those same interests, who knew what it was like to make personal sacrifices and to have everything or have everything that we love and know leave behind so that we could pursue these goals and these opportunities. And after that program ended, we agreed that every year that we possibly could, we would go on some sort of adventure together, whether it was meeting up in Boston one year or hiking the Zion Narrows or even going to the Banff Mountain Film Festival. And one of the bigger trips that we did was in Peru hiking the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu. Organizing this trip took quite a bit of logistics because I needed to find a break in one of the space robotics programs I was working on to take vacation and she was getting ready to leave Australia and move to pursue graduate studies in California. So we had everything set where we were going to meet up in Lima, then head on to Cusco and then start the Inca Trail on to Machu Picchu. So everything was going fine and according to plan until the first day of the hike when it started torrentially raining. And I'm talking like the kind of rain that you think can only rain for about an hour or so before it rains itself out. But as we started the trail, because we had no other choice, we were there, it just kept raining hour after hour and then into the next day and the day after that and turning into a blizzard and hail and snow over the big mounted passes that we went over. And this is the kind of weather that really makes or breaks you, that really wears down your spirits because those big panoramas and mountain views that you've been, you've been so anxious to see as the preparations for this trip became nearer and nearer were just covered in a wall of fog and you're cold and you're miserable and everything is soaking wet. On our last night on the Inca Trail, we went to bed with the plan to rise early in the morning at 3 a.m. so that we could hike to the sun gate and see the sunrise. And when we emerged from our tent at 3 a.m., I had seen a sight that was so incredibly beautiful and I had seen very rarely, which was thousands and thousands and thousands of stars. The skies had cleared and it was just a gorgeous vista to take in and it, we knew immediately that we were in for a great day on our last day actually hiking to the Sun Gate and going to Machu Picchu. So we started out hiking side by side on this last leg of our journey and my friend started to feel a little under the weather. Could have been a combination of the weather or something she had eaten or even the altitude. And she was hiking very slowly and couldn't keep up with the pace that I was setting. 
and I was so anxious to get to the top to want to see that view that I made the decision to leave her behind and continue hiking to the top. And that's exactly what I did, getting to the sun gate, standing there alone, taking in one incredible vista. Except that I had this awful gut-wrenching feeling while I was standing there all alone, knowing that I had left someone behind in order to prioritize my own success rather than helping someone else succeed, rather than using my resources to help her get to the top, to help motivate her and finish that journey together side by side, I decided to focus on my own goals, on being there first, on being the fastest and proving my own capabilities. And I thought about that a lot on the train ride back to Cusco, on the flight back to Toronto, and for many weeks and months after that. Eventually, I connected the dots between that singular experience and the goals in my own life, and that I didn't want to be chasing this dream of traveling to space, uh, becoming an astronaut, if it meant that I was so narrowly focused on myself and only myself. We can be ambitious and yet still take time to give back and help others. I mentioned a few minutes ago how important courage, conviction, and confidence have been in my own life, and I want to add a fourth trait to that mix, and that's compassion a willingness to help and care for others, a willingness to use our platform and our privilege to help others succeed in whatever version of success looks like to each individual. When I was growing up, I didn't have that many mentors and role models, that many people I could ask questions to to help find my path. I wish I could have just sent an email to astronauts and aerospace engineers or picked up a phone and called them and queried them with all of my questions about what I should study in university or what types of internships I should pursue or if there are any scholarships available. And I've realized over the past few years that I'm now in a position to do just that, to share my experiences, to share my lessons learned, to talk about why I love working on the stuff that I do, to help make it easier for others who come after me to pursue a similar path. And this is so important in science, technology, engineering, and math, to have those role models, those mentors, those sponsors, and people who will help lift each other up. And particularly for young women and minorities, where there can often be obstacles that have no business being obstacles. If you are in a position of power or in a position to help make things better for somebody else, remember that kindness empowers, remember that kindness motivates, and remember that kindness inspires. When I was on that journey to Machu Picchu with my friend and on the many team-based projects that I've had the privilege to work on at MDA, I've come to appreciate that having one another's back, that helping each individual on a team succeed and thereby helping the entire team succeed is a positive and gratifying path. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter if I ever become an astronaut. And spoiler alert, I'm not one yet and I might never become one. But most important are the legacies that we leave behind. Real success is defined by how much we touch and enrich each other's lives, how much we are able to make a difference. And so I have one ask of every single person in this room today, and that's next time you go into a room, whether it's a meeting, whether it's an event or a function, or even a classroom, take stock of exactly who is in that room. Take a look around and see who the people in that room look like. If everybody in that room looks like you, then something needs to change, and you have the power to make that change. If you see someone who's not being recognized for their work, take the time to recognize them and acknowledge them and share appreciation for what they've done. If you see someone or opportunities that aren't unfair, make sure that you speak up to rectify the situation and make sure that those unfair situations never happen again. If you see biases in the workplace or any other space, speak up because you have more power than you know to change the culture and create positive change. And today I wanna to leave you with last, one last final thought, one thing that I heard on an internship at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, and I'm paraphrasing slightly here, but listen to your thoughts as they become your words. Listen to your words as they become your actions. Listen to your actions as it becomes your character, and your character becomes your purpose. Thoughts become words, words become actions, actions become character, and your character becomes your purpose. And that every idea you have, and that all the goals you set, and all the actions you take to achieve those goals, make compassion and helping other people just as much a part of your purpose as achieving your own goals. Thank you very much, and congratulations again.
Dr. Panic, thank you for sharing your experiences with us and for showing us a good vision that I think we could all embrace.